I'm Father Robert Lawton, president of Loyola Marymount University, a university proud and fortunate to be in Los Angeles. I've been lucky enough to live much of my life in great world cities. I grew up on the East Coast, lived in Washington, New York, Boston. Then I moved to Europe, lived in Munich and Berlin, Florence and Rome. All these are great world cities, but they're old as great world cities. And I used to think sometimes when I was in them, what would it have been like to live in one of these cities when it was in its youth as a great world city? Well, now I get that chance. Los Angeles is a great world city, arguably the great world city, and yet it's in its youth, or maybe in its adolescence, full of optimism and energy and hope and great spirit. And so in studying this great and wonderful city, we're studying not only the city itself, but the modern world, because that's what great cities do. They live very intensely, the modern world. And in a city like Los Angeles, uh, it also lives the future as well. The future feels closer in Los Angeles than anywhere else. So this urban lecture series studies a city, but it studies our world, it studies our future. I hope that you enjoy today's lecture. Today we have a great panel. We're going to talk about the number one issue facing Los Angeles, the number one issue facing America, and that is education. Uh, here at the Levy Center, we have conducted over, I would say, 25 different surveys of all kinds of types, telephone surveys, face-to-face um, -face surveys, exit polls, uh, all kinds of different polls. And it, it, we always ask, what's the number one issue facing Los Angeles or Southern California, depending on what the jurisdiction is? And Education is always number one. It is the most important issue on every account, on every survey, uh, every ethnic group, geographic group, religious group, you name it, and they will uh, identify education as the number one issue. Yet, a couple of weeks ago, when we had an election for school board, only 18% of Los Angelinos thought it was important enough to come out and elect the successor to one of our panelists here. So it, it's a, it, while we say it's the most important thing, how we act on it in terms of voting, in terms of resources, in terms of really putting our attention to it, it uh, sometimes differ. To discuss these issues and all education things considered, we've put together what I consider a, a great panel. Um, first and foremost, uh, sitting next to me is the current school board member, Los Angeles Unified School Board member, um, Marlene Cantor. Uh, she's been on the school board for eight years, and, and she decided to retire this, uh, this year. So uh, she did not run for re-election, and she will be a school board member until um, uh, June 30th. On July 1st, uh, there will be a, a replacement, and we're going to talk to her about why she's uh, decided not to be a public figure anymore. Um, actually, you know, and we also uh, have um, with us is Dean Shane Martin uh, from the School of Education here at Loyola Marymount University. Uh, uh, Shane has been a, a faculty member here for a, a long time, but not as long as I have, but still a long time. Uh, and uh, after uh, we needed a new dean, we asked everybody in the School of Ed Education. No one said uh, yes except for Shane, so we decided to give him the job. <laughs> Does that mean they didn't ask you, Fernando? No, they, I was overqualified, I was told. No. Um, and, uh, and finally, our, our guest from out of town, uh, who sometimes doesn't understand our internal jokes, uh, is uh, Pedro Noguera from uh, New York University. Uh, Pedro is a, a, an accomplished educator, author, also a public servant. At one point, you served on the Berkeley uh, uh, School Board, so he's got a lot of different perspectives, uh, nationally renowned uh, scholar. And one of the things I, I only gave you a, a short, brief uh, discussion on each of them is because I'm going to ask them to talk a little bit about how did they get to where they are in terms of education. And uh, I'm going to start with you, Marlene. What prepared you to be on the school board, and what surprised you the most when you think back about your eight years or seven and a half years right now that surprised you the most about uh, being a school board member and what do you wish and what skill sets do you wish you had uh, really uh, prepared yourself before you took on th this responsibility okay thank you and thank you for inviting me here I think that I prepared my entire life to be on the school board because I was brought up in a home where my mom was a teacher and um, I went to school and I became a teacher. I decided to teach special education because I really felt 
a need to be really um, personal and, and, and really teach in a relationship way and to really learn more about differentiated learning, which I found in special education. So um, I entered um, my career as a special education teacher actually in LA Unified in the early 70s. And I still, when I came back as a school board member, they gave me my employee number, so it was really kind of full circle for me. Um, I taught for about eight years, and it, was, it didn't take me very long in my teaching to realize that I didn't have all the skills I needed to be a teacher, especially uh, classroom management skills. And so um, with my former husband, we wrote a book and a program called The Sort of Discipline. It became a phenomenal success, not only for me in my classroom, but for teachers nationwide. That was the basis for a business which I ran for 25 years and sold it to Sylvan Learning in the year 2000 and decided to run for the school board to take um, all the um, lessons learned from inside the classroom and from running a business in the education sector to the school board. And um, I really believe that I have the skill set that you need to be a school board member. It's, it's unfortunate that most people who have this kind of skill set don't run. There's a lot of reasons why they don't, but I think you have to have a, a very a very varied school uh, set of skills. Having said that, and I'll finish with your last thing, is what was the most surprising thing to me. And you have to remember, I came from understanding education, understanding business, and that's the two ma major parts and operations of business. But I honestly was not prepared for the amount of reading and the amount that you needed to know every other week as the school board meetings came to us um, on policies that we needed to vote on and you can't just vote on a policy you have to understand it and I felt like if this was if this was rigorous for me and I had a lot of the background I could only imagine what it's like for people who come to the seat without that kind of experience and the last thing is is the only real thing that I didn't have a lot of experience in and I've learned since is you know we're building 150 new schools, which takes on the whole construction side of um, skill set and real estate and environmental issues, and I really needed to study up on that. So, you know, there's the old joke about um, the CEO left the company and he left three envelopes for a successor, and he said every time you have a major issue, open up an envelope. And the first envelope, he opened it up when he had a, his first problem. He said, "Blame your successor." And then the second envelope he opened up and it said, uh, conduct a study and commission a study. And then the third envelope was, prepare three envelopes. <laughs> <laughs> what would you tell your successor, the number one thing about how they should be prepared in terms of what they're going to do? Well, I think the most important thing, and of, of course this is coming from me and obviously, but people who know me know that this is what I feel, is I really feel that you have to have a really solid core of your own set of values and your own wisdom about what you think is right and wrong. And you have to keep that focus diligently every day, knowing that what you're doing is affecting hundreds of thousands of people and children. And, um, and then there's, there's lots of influencers who try to sway you from place to place. But I also think you have to know that you are an elected public servant for your constituents, and you are there representing the children who really do not have any other voice. And so um, I think that's just really, really important. And to study up and to know that this is real. I mean, the, the votes that these seven people take in Los Angeles affect so many people every single day. And so um, I just would like my successor to take it as seriously as I've taken it. If you take a look at the budget of LA Unified, I think it's bigger than the budget of half the states in the country, and that your own district, there are more voters and people in your own district than in than, uh, Sarah Palin's district of the state of Alaska. So more people yeah. live in your district than live in the whole state of Alaska. And, and Roy Romer said it so well when he said after being a governor of the state of Colorado for 12 years, this, there was never as challenging a day as the days that he had as superintendent of the school district. The, um, and again, we're twice the size of the city. Our budget's twice the size. Um, there's seven of us. There's 15 city council people. Their districts are half the size of ours. 
Um, we don't need to talk about the salary parts of it, but it, there, it, there's a lot of inequities, and um, it's a humongous job. And you, you have to, you, I think in order to run, you should have to go through a, a, a passion meter of some sort that says, I love this work, I love this job, I love children, and that's why I'm doing this work, because um, you can get so easily swayed. It's, um, it, you have to really be careful to keep your core. And let me turn to Shane, who actually broke the passion meter here at LMU. He is a great teacher, a great scholar, a great administrator. He, um, and I have tenure. I don't report to him, so I'm, I'm saying these things uh, uh, genuinely. He, he's also um, done a lot of things. He's been uh, sat on boards outside of uh, LMU, um, been active uh, in terms of trying to take education beyond our, our campus. Um, how, how well does the School of Education at Loyola Marymount University prepare students, and what has been the number one change that you've tried to instill since you've been in dean, a dean to prepare students to go out there and be effective teachers? Well, first of all, it's a real pleasure to be on this panel and to be joined by such wonderful colleagues uh, as Pedro Noguera and Marlene Cantor and um, Fernando, thank you for moderating this, this panel. When I first came to the LMU School of Education, I felt an immediate um, fit with, with my own educational values uh, and what was happening here. And as I've uh, been here over about a 15-year period and been in different positions uh, as an assistant professor, associate professor, and, and now in the deanship role, um, you know, to, to answer your question about what, what do I think we do uh, that uniquely prepares educators, I'll share with you the feedback that I regularly get from those people that hire our graduates as teachers, as counselors, as administrators. And, you know, as I talk to superintendents, associate superintendents, principals in schools, they are very complimentary of uh, the LMU graduates out of our education program. And there's a few characteristics that they tell me that they cons consistently see uh, that come out of LMU. First of all, uh, the, the graduates of our programs come out with heart and passion, and they have a real focus on relationships. They understand that knowing the communities, the, the children and the families they come from that they're teaching is as critical to success as knowing strategies and methods for teaching, that these are all really important. So there's a important heart connection, a relationship connection, a community uh, connection. Uh, secondly, that they know what to do. They immediately move into positions in classrooms and, and, and leadership positions in schools. They're competent, they know what to do. They emerge as leaders, teacher leaders, principal leaders, etc., cetera, um, and they know why they choose to do what they do. So they have a good knowledge base, and they also have the heart, the soul, and the passion. And I've certainly found that uh, in my own experience. So I was fortunate that, uh, it, you know, coming in as dean, I was able to build on the incredible work of the faculty, of the inaugural dean, Father Copas, uh, uh, and of my colleagues. In particular, though, uh, what, what I think we have added the last few years is um, in addition to looking at our programs that are training heartfelt, passionate teachers and principals who are competent, to also engage this city, Los Angeles, the region, in terms of educational reform. And to look at how the university cannot simply put universe, uh, good teachers in classrooms, but how we can also use our resources to be a leader and a champion uh, for helping urban reform change happen in, you know, in the surrounding area. So we've looked more at policy issues, we've looked more at change, we've looked more at um, how we can leverage that as a university. And I think that's something we've done more of in the last few years. Um, Pe Pedro, put uh, LA Unified in national perspective. I mean, you've been looking at uh, big urban uh, school systems throughout the country. When people talk about us outside of LA, um, what do they say? What, what is, uh, uh, do they feel like many of us hear that the system's not working, that it's too big, or, or, or what is the rap on LA? Well, <clears throat> I'm sad to say it's not good. Very bad. 
I would say that LA. Uh, thank you, Pedro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to go to Angela now, and <laughs> you know, I, and and I, um, I think it's really important to be as candid as possible because if you don't really face up to it, you're not going to make any progress. Uh, and the truth is, there are several urban districts now in the country where this progress is being made. New York, which is larger than L.A., is one of them. That's just because you live there. I, I, you know, and, and when I'm there, I am one of the biggest critics of Joel Klein. And I consistently point out the ways in which the schools are still not as good as they should be. You know, Pedro, explain to the students Joel Klein. And, uh, I'm sorry, Joel Klein is the chancellor of uh, public schools in New York City. Uh, and I work with him. And I think it's very important that you both are, we're both able to critique, but also to engage and address. So it's not simply about standing on the sideline and pointing out what's wrong. It's also going in and figuring out, okay, what do we need to do to address it? If you look at New York, Boston, Atlanta, they are all far superior. Charlotte, and it shows. I, I would tell you that the, the, the data, just on fourth graders alone, it will make you want to cry for LA. Okay. LA is really, and a little time a few years ago, um, working with LA County and trying to come up with a plan uh, to provide services in schools for the county, including uh, LA Unified. And uh, we started working on the plan, and uh, because we knew that there were a lot of high need children in this in the system. And then, uh, as we went all out developing the plan, we started to realize it would be impossible to implement because of the politics in LA because getting cities and school districts to work together is so difficult. Now, I'm glad Angela's here because she's working on that now. And, and, I, and I'm, again, I'm not saying this to just throw rocks, okay, because I think we all know that when the school systems don't work, it contributes to lots of other problems that you're facing. Okay? But LA has one of the highest dropout rates in the country right now, okay, particularly for African-American Latino males. Uh, so I would say the situation is not good and uh, I'm not, at one point, I had one of the highest numbers of uncredentialed teachers in the country. I'm not sure if that's changed. It's changed. It's changed. Good. <laughs> yeah, over the but, last, but, over the last years, say, it's changed. Dramatic. At one point, when I was a, a professor at Berkeley, I used to tell my Berkeley students, they contact me and say, well, I can't find a job. I said, well, if you can't find a job, two days before school starts, go to L.A. And they will hire you. And they will put you in a classroom with 35 to 40 kids and say, good luck. And I, I, I hated to, 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 that that was true, but I knew it was true. Now, maybe it's not true now, and I hope that's the case. But uh, I, I remember talking to Bud Rome. I just actually was in a meeting with him uh, a few weeks ago, and he was just kind of giving me a sense of the immensity of the challenges here in the, in the, in the district. And what I kept, as I listened to him, I was struck by the fact that unlike when you talk to Beverly Hall, for example, in Atlanta, now Atlanta's much smaller than LA, but New York is bigger. Okay. When you talk to Joel Klein, they have a clarity about what needs to happen. Okay. And it's very, it's, they know what they're doing. And, and even in the schools where they're not making progress, they even have a plan for that. Now, whether or not the plan is working is another thing. Uh, and what I was struck by, there wasn't a plan. And uh, I hope that that's changing because uh, what we know now is that we have a number of schools around the country, some are charter, but some are public, that are showing poverty is not an issue if you provide good quality education, not speaking English, not an issue. That is, schools can compensate for what families can't provide if there's care given to the quality of the education provided. So let's uh, introduce Angela Bass, who's Superintendent of Instruction, um, Partnership for Los Angeles School. Uh, Angela acts as Superintendent of Instruction for all 10 partnership schools, and we're going to have her explain what partnership schools are. She's been an educator for over 30 years. Uh, she has uh, been at LA Unified and San Diego Unified, which is the second largest uh, school district in the state. Uh, she's graduated as a fellow in the Broad Urban Superintendents Academy. 
She has also been involved in many education programs such as Head Start, the Cambridge Leadership Associates at Harvard University, and the Association of African American Educators and many other. Uh, welcome, Angela. And what is the partnership for Los Angeles schools? I think I um, first need to say that while there are many challenges in Los Angeles Unified School Districts, District, I have to say that there's much hope. Uh, the partnership for LA, Youth, LA Schools is a partnership that is a one that is branched with Los Angeles Unified School District and the mayor. Um, as some of you may know and some may not, the mayor in his attempts to improve the quality of education in Los Angeles has had a strong desire to have some leadership role in, within the schools. And without going into a lot of history, they went from a, an attempt to do what has happened in New York, in uh, Chicago, Boston, is to have mayoral control over the schools. Um, that has proved unsuccessful. But what I would say about uh, Mayor Villaraigosa is that he didn't quit. He continued to work and partner with the district and um, con came to an agreement to allow 10 schools. Um, and the schools were selected by um, parent vote, which we received 90% of the vote, and teacher vote 50% with an agreement with UTLA to be able to take these schools on and utilize innovation and a better service model than what's currently being used in the broader district of 700,000 children to improve the schools. We've taken on 10 of the lowest performing schools in the district and our goal is to really wrap around services to, with these schools and work in a collaborative manner to improve the schools. The 10 schools that we serve, two high schools, the largest high school in the state of California, Roosevelt High School, 4,800 students is now, for the first time in 15 years, going to go to a traditional year-round school, and um, that's significant for the school. Santee High School is one of the latest um, built schools, 3,700 students, um, and year-round multi-track, four by four schools uh, that we have, and then four middle schools, two in East LA, two in South and Watts, and then four elementary schools, three in South, uh, LA and Watts and one in East LA connected to Hollenbeck and Roosevelt. So our attempt is to really create a system of new innovations for our schools and add a personal touch. When we began these schools in July of 2008, they were pretty depleted. Um, schools were not clean. Um, large numbers of new teachers, uh, te principals who were leading from the top and not listening to teachers in classrooms, to be honest with you, there are classrooms that had no books in them, um, they had a curriculum, um, and yet many of the teachers who were in those classrooms didn't really know how to utilize the curriculum in a way to accelerate performance. Parent involvement was at an all-time low, so it's very interesting that 90% when we went out and um, polled parents who wanted to be in the partnership, 90% of the parents wanted something different. I don't know if they knew what the difference was, but they knew that what was happening for their children's school was not working. Nine of the 10 are in the um, academic performance index at the lowest 10% of the state API ones, and one elementary school is an API two. What we've really tried to provide is just a quality personalized support. Um, we have a 501c3 that allows us to have additional dollars from um, outside funders, and we are really going in and really recrafting and reshaping the cultures of the schools. As we went to the 10 schools, um, the biggest concern from teachers, parents, students, and administrators was morale. The second, while these schools had a lot of uh, federal and state fu federal funding, I should say, because of the poverty level of children, the teachers did have very uh, few resources. And I say the third thing is the quality of the curriculum and planning in the classrooms was not happening and, and expectations were very low. So we started with a strong leadership development, strong professional development, um, because what we found is wasn't that the teachers didn't care, they did not have the skills to adequately teach effectively on a full day in the classroom. So um, all the teachers are still LA Unified employees? All, all staff, all teachers, all classified staff, and then we hired, um, we were able to hire of the 10, seven new administrators. We offered all administrators the opportunity to um, remain with us, those who were there last year. Um, only three of the administrators stayed and we hired seven new administrators because we had high expectations of three hours of uh, instructional focus in the classroom by every administrator on the campus. So, and who do you report to? I report to, I work with uh, my partner, CEO Marshall Tuck, 
And I think I have a joint um, um, report, one to the board of LAUSD as a believer in the partnership and the superintendent Cortinas as well as to the mayor. Yeah. Um, Marlene, I want you to add, uh, reform, reform, reform. Pe Pedro, Marlene, we've been talking about reform in Los Angeles. I remember LAMP, I remember LEARN. Now we have charter schools. Now we've created this uh, partnership for LA schools. Here at Loyola Marymount, something I'm gonna have Shane talk about the family of schools. Is this all a way to try to get away from LA Unified? And how does the school board and the administration feel about the partnership of, uh, of schools? You weren't for it at the beginning, as I recall, reading the papers. Um, no, no, that's, let me. Th I shouldn't was, believe what I read in the papers? No, 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 I think that we're talking about two different things because um, it became very apparent to me in um, in the the debate that we had and the fight that we had over to the mayor control the schools or the school board control the schools. I was the school board president at the time, so um, I worked very hard on this. And it became very apparent to me that when there was somebody like the mayor who wanted to offer um, reform and offer support, other than um, creating a charter school, there was really no other access point into the district for partnerships. And so um, after we found that, um, that what the way the mayor had wanted to take over was unconstitutional, um, it was still very much a desire of mine to create a way for us to create partnerships. And so um, we created the iDesign division, which is an innovation division that gives, gives um, our constituents and stakeholders another opportunity instead of they don't want to go charter, but they want to create some kind of innovation, they can apply to the innovation division. And the mayor's partnership became one of five that are now part of um, the iDesign division that reports directly to the school district. And the school district still governs that with an ability for us as a school district to provide Angela and her schools the kind of flexibility that they need in order to create Reform. One of the things that I have found out from chairing the charter committee um, is that it's really impossible to replicate charters um, in the state of California. I could only talk for our state because charters, in, we have 150 charters. We have many more coming on board. Um, we have more than anybody in the United States. Some of them work, some of them don't. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of nuances about it, but the one thing that they all have is freedom from the ed code and freedom from collective bargaining. And um, the Ed Code defines, amongst a lot of other things, the way in which you receive your resources, the money. And we receive the money in our schools in a very antiquated, ineffective way, which is in silos. So for instance, if you get um, gifted and talented money and you don't need all of it that year, you can't spend it for something else. It's a, and I can only speak for the state of California. In charters, you get a lump sum amount of money, and that's what we're trying to, to do for our innovation schools. Collective bargaining, which is um, our union agreements, is also something that I believe very strongly needs to be, um, needs to be reformed um, because it limits us in our ability to put teachers and administrators in schools where they really are effective. And so um, it, we're not, it's not, for me, a way to, um, to get rid of LA Unified. For me, it's a way for us to create the kind of reforms that other places are able to do in this very politicized environment that we live in here and trying to work within that politicized environment um, to create an atmosphere for children where they're actually learning. And I just wanted to say one, um, one other thing, and that is that I know from a governance point of view, there's a lot of reasons why certain places work and uh, districts work and other ones don't, but I'm really still very much a believer, and maybe this is because I come from being a teacher, that um, if we don't, and, and, I, and I go back to what Shane said, which is how, LA, how LMU trains and what we say about their teachers, and back to what Angela said, which is the teachers don't have skills, somewhere in between that, I believe that in order for us to effectively teach children across the nation, we have to, all of us, better understand how to recruit and then train people in the teaching profession so that when they enter the classroom, they are prepared to teach. Because LA Unified spends way over 
$300 million a year on professional development, which is all okay, except that we have to most of the time retrain people of course, not from LMU, but we have to we have to re we have to retrain people as they enter the classroom in order to have the skills that you need in urban education, which is very very complicated and challenging. So, um, I do agree that there is hope. Um, it's very complicated, and um, it also brings tears to my eyes to hear how Pedro characterizes it. Not because he's wrong, because the truth is the truth, and and you know. <coughs> Perception is reality, and um, and I took this. I, I went for this job in order to get inside of the district in order to better understand why we're still in this place. I'm exiting at this point in time because there's still work to be done ab above and beyond the district that I feel that I can contribute to to help create a better educational environment. Shane, we have a lot of undergraduate students out in our audience. Explain to them this whole reform movement the LMU, what we're doing with L in terms of LMU, and w what is happening, and then, uh, Pedro, if you can put that more in a, a national context in terms of the reforms, what reforms work? What reforms have you seen work, and is LA in the right path? Shane? Sure, well, Marlene talked about um, the innovation division now called iDesign Schools, which is a place that was created in LAUSD to incubate new ideas, and. Uh, of course, Angela is superintendent of the partnership, um, the, uh, the mayor's schools, as we often talk about them. And as Marlene mentioned, there's five other of these, or four other of these types of partnerships. Um, LMU also entered into a partnership, and, and part of this grew out of the relationships we had with our local schools. Uh, three, four years ago, as here in the School of Added LMU, as we were looking at ways to develop our own strategic vision and plan, uh, as a school of ed to come together to support reform in public education, we realized, in fact, that our local public schools, Westchester High, which is about a mile down the street. Which, by the way, my proposal is that Westchester High's basketball team play our schedule and our Loyola Marymount team play their schedule. <laughs> and maybe we can have a winning basketball team. And sorry, Shane, go ahead. Westchester High has a terrific basketball team, just, absolutely. They'll be playing for the state championship. That's right. And we will not be in the NCAA tournament. <laughs> this, this, this is true. Uh, but, but sadly, though, sadly, if we look at other pieces of, of Westchester High School, this is the largest African-American student-populated high school in all of LAUSD by percentage, 75 percentage points, 20% um, Latino, uh, a school just under 2,000 students. And yet, when we look at achievement, as, as measured in, in the standardized testing uh, ways, the profile looks more like an inner city school. And so we, we looked at how can we take our resources as a university and partner uh, our faculty and our students and create opportunities to work with teachers, parents, community leaders, uh, business leaders, to help build up what's happening in the schools. And this um, initiative was happening at the same time that Marlene and her colleagues were creating the uh, I division. So we formally entered into this relationship. And, and I want to say just a, a brief commentary. This work is not at all easy. It really isn't. I mean, Marlene is leaving the district now after eight years, and she will leave a legacy in terms of what she's done for charter schools and the I design. And, what she's done for student nutrition and some other key issues she's worked on. Uh, but this district, as Pedro has said, is, is, is extremely challenging, extremely complex, and I don't think we can underestimate the enormity of the challenge in front of us and the numbers of kids that are continuing to fall through the cracks every day. So what the Family of Schools is, is an attempt to take the second largest public school district in the country uh, that, you know, is hard to get your hands around and say, how can we help reform LAUSD. You know, so many people have tried to do this and not been able to be successful. What we can do at LMU is work with seven schools, a family of schools, have uh, relationships. What, what are the seven schools? It's a high school, Westchester middle school? Westchester High School, the middle school, Orville Wright that feeds into that, and then the five elementary schools. Uh, but it's about building meaningful relationships, mm -hmm. building the, the, the educational pipeline so that there's articulation between the elementary school, the middle school, and the high school. 
that the faculty here at LMU, in the School of Ed, but across the university, can work with the faculty uh, at these schools, that we can share resources, we can have the teachers have access to our libraries, we can have our student teachers there, we can, we can truly make a difference because this is our community, you know? And so that's something that we've been doing and it has how do, not been easy. How will we know it's successful? Well, there's probably different ways. I mean, the traditional measures is we'll look at achievement, we'll look at how students are performing on standardized measures, achievement tests. Uh, what I think is really even, even more important to look at is, you know, are kids staying in school? Are they finishing? Are they graduating? We know that there are large numbers of students who are dropping out of school in California, and sadly, the largest group are African-American students, followed by our Latino students. You know, close to 45% of African-Americans in California uh, don't finish high school. What kind of future does a young person in this economy and in this time who doesn't finish high school, what kind of future is there? So we've got to turn this around so that kids have options uh, in life to finish college, to go into the workforce, or this region, Los Angeles, is not going to make it as a region. If we don't educate the next generation of leaders, we are not going to make it. Pedro, you see this nationally, but it seems like every two years we have a new reform. It's the you know, reform of the month, reform of the year. And in a sense, we don't even give all the reforms a chance because new school board members come in, new mayors, new uh, administrators, and they say, oh, well, I want my new reform. In education, everybody's an expert because, hey, I went to school, I graduated, I'm okay, I know, what's, I know what works. Um, are there reforms that have been working out there in urban America? Uh, is LA in the, uh, on the right path? Well, I think if they, you know, you started, you, you put your finger on an important point. If you have too much political infighting, if you have too much turnover in direction, in strategy, you're not going to make any progress. And if you look at this, the districts where you've had constant upheaval, um, you see they're floundering and they're, they're, they're not succeeding. Um, if you look at the districts that are making progress, they've had a lot of stability and leadership. And they're not all, some of them are mayoral control, not all of them are. Atlanta has a school board. Um, it's a question, but I would also say this, that it's not even simply what the schools do. What is the city doing? I mean, I'm glad to hear they have a plan for wraparound services. LA has other resources. It, it has universities, so I'm glad to hear there's a partnership. It has hospitals, it has, the, the film industry is based here. One of the things that's happened in New York is we have partnerships between schools and a variety of, of organizations, from museums to hospitals to nonprofits, because the idea is to draw upon the, 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 the intellectual capital, the social capital of the city to strengthen schools. And where that, those partnerships work, you're seeing real change. It also makes a difference when you hire good principals. And, and I have to put a lot of emphasis on that because good principals will attract and support good teachers and won't have as high turnover. Yeah, but that's, what's the definition of a good principal? Of course I want to hire a good principal. Who well, wants to hire, they, nobody they, goes they, out there purposely have to, to hire a bad principal. People who are able to m mobilize resources, recruit resources, inspire their staff around a common vision, um, engage their parents and community, and develop and stick with a coherent plan for how they're going to educate the kids. But that, you would also require an environment where for someone to empower the community, they need to be empowered. And it seems that principals, especially in California and LA Unified, with all the codes, all the laws that they have to fo fo follow, the union and the collective bargaining, that you could put the greatest leader sometimes there, but they can't do anything. They, their hands are tied. They tell somebody, go and do something, and they say, I don't have to, I don't want to. Um, and, that, and that's a big problem. And that's part of the problem, reason why so many of these schools fail. Uh, because the, the bureaucratic structures get in the way of educating children. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons why charters do have, often have an advantage over regular public schools. Boston's been experimenting with something called pilot schools, which are regular public schools but are freed from a lot of the policies and regulations. And many of those pilot schools are outstanding. And uh, they still have a union, they still have collective bargaining, but they don't have all of the other kinds of... Uh, uh, regulations that often make the job of, of a principal more difficult. Marlene? Yes, I was going to um, say that I think, I think Pedro is absolutely right in terms of partnerships. I know that here, particularly 
um, the entertainment industry. We've been struggling to get them involved and been working really hard. We've, we had um, one of the agencies support us by rebuilding an auditorium and was, you know, and yet that's still, it, we, need, we need a lot more than, than the relationships. And I think that what I'm seeing, um, one of the lessons learned from the eight years that I've been here is that unless Los Angeles comes together with um, a united strategic plan for how we're going to move from where we are to where we need to go, and we can put egos by the side, and we can say this is what works, and this is what doesn't work, and these are the kids, and this is our demographics. It's different from New York or, or Atlanta or whatever, but this is who we are. But we have so many people here who, who do not agree on the way in which we should um, conduct ourselves as adults, let alone what strategies we should use with children. And so I just feel that um, as adults, um, I just think we need to look, take a look at ourselves, those of us who work here and are leaders in the city, and there's many, many of us to say, what part do we play in helping to move LA forward, and what part do we play in keeping us from going forward? And until we can have those kinds of honest conversations, and I'll give you just an example, and I, so an example of something I was really pleased with. And um, yesterday, my uh, charter committee, we host um, field trips around the city to look at, um, at schools that are doing different things, best practices. And we went to Lock High School yesterday, and Green Dot Charter um, Organization has taken over Lock. It's the first charter organization to take over a, um, a large urban high school. And one of the things that I was concerned about was that they had taken the lowest performing students, um, the students that had the least amount of credits, and put them in, um, in a large room with computers and put them, in, put them with a program that would help them to recover their credits. It's called um, Action Learning. And I have, had heard about it in like October and had been very concerned about it. And I was just so pleased because when I went back there yesterday, and talk to the leadership there, they also were able to say, we don't know if this is really working. We don't know if our lowest performer should really only be here four hours a day. Because there's another um, charter organization, the Alliance, that feels that their lowest performance performers needs to be there one hour extra a day and two weeks extra a year. So here's one group that's saying computers, one group saying, and I'm saying that as leaders in the city, we need to rise to the occasion because who else is going to do it if it's not us? And we need to put egos aside and put our intelligence together and start really thinking about what works, what doesn't work, and how are we going to push this agenda quickly because we have kids that only have one chance in school. And I've been here eight years, and the children that came in with me when they were in kindergarten, they're now in eighth grade, you know, and so it's, it goes by like that. And we don't have time for every new board member to come in with a whole new policy agenda of what they think works and what doesn't work. We as people who have been in the field of education, I've been in the field for um, over 30 years, all of us at the table have been doing this. We're the ones that I think need to, and I'm talking about here in Los Angeles because I can only talk for Los Angeles, we need to take the time to sit down and, and really come together and move this forward. We don't have time to waste. Angela, let me ask you a couple of questions about governance. As Pedro mentioned, in New York, the mayor is in charge. In Los Angeles, the school board's in charge. And I think there are other hybrids where the mayor, some places you elect some board members and the mayor or some other body appoints some, some others. So um, what, from what your perspective, does it make a difference in terms of that type of governance, governance number one? And then number two, superintendents. Um, we mentioned Joe Klein of New York. He came from the private sector. He's a lawyer. Uh, we had former governor of Colorado, Romer, who was the superintendent here in Los Angeles. We can also obviously have a pro someone who went through, was started as a teacher, principal, administrating the whole thing and become a, uh, a superintendent. We can, you know, maybe get a dean of education uh, to become a, a superintendent. Um, I don't know how that would work, but uh, the, the, who talk about both the governance in terms of 
mayor controlled or school board controlled and the type of superintendents that we see emerging? I think, I think the governance really has to be, whether it's mayoral control or a, a traditional school district, has to be a body of adults who are solely committed to making sure that the policies that live in our schools are carried out and have a commitment to ensure that all children have a quality education. I think that it can happen, as uh, Dr. Naguera said, it's happening in Atlanta. So it can happen when you have the right people at the right table for the right reasons. And I think that's the dividing, you know, that's the divider. When you have people who have other agendas about how schools are run, then we have a lot of people running around trying to do a lot of different things that in the end don't serve the greatest needs of our children in urban schools. So, But I mean, let me stop you there, because yeah. there are a lot of great people who have a lot of great ideas, and sometimes they conflict. So wouldn't it make sense, just as a theory, that there be one person in charge who we can blame and who has control, and that would be the mayor? I mean, one person. It's your fault, or you need to do it, other than the superintendent, the unions, the teachers, the school board, etc. I mean, when things go wrong here at the School of Education, we blame Shane. We know, okay? He messed up, okay? And then when things go well, it was the faculties. Uh, um, so, but there needs to be accountability with one person. It's, it's just so much easier, and I'll get uh, Marlene to answer it. Uh, I honestly that. believe that there has to be a great leader at the helm. I also believe that it has to be a collaboration. It cannot just be one person. One person is going to take the hit at the end of the day, but really it's the entire community that takes a hit when our children do not achieve. So we have to figure out, knowing that there has to be someone in charge, but really create a design of collaboration where the superintendent, the school board, uh, administration teachers, there has to be a collaboration, there has to be an ownership, and there has to be a level of trust and relationship around the core belief that our goal is to educate all children. How, well, why don't you respond to that? I want the mayor, I, not necessarily this particular mayor, although I, 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 mean, I, I want you to be mayor and then run the school system. Okay. I agree with, um, I agree with Angela. There has to be a capable leader in the, at the helm. I mean, that, uh, not only a capable leader, but a brave, intelligent leader um, who is willing to push the agenda forward for the kids and, say, and doesn't take no for an answer. And, um, and those are hard to find. But you also have to have a leader that understands the complicated nature of the work that needs to be done. And I'm not talking about the adult work. I'm talking about the complicated nature of what it takes to teach um, the demographics of the particular city that you happen to live in. Um, and, and we have our own unique set of challenges here in Los Angeles. So um, it's for me, and it also, you also have to have an arena where whoever is in charge um, can also have the, the constituents who are the parents and the kids have access to so that you can create some kind of community. But um, I think that it, I would be remiss if I didn't spend a few minutes talking about the challenge that we have in this particular city of the teachers union and how I believe and have believed since the day I got here that the teachers union has the potential to be our greatest partners for reform and they also have the potential to be our you know the greatest obstacle to reform and it really is an it, it really for me are they an obstacle there the a lot of the um, a lot of the collective bargaining agreement that we operate under limits our ability to do the kinds of things that I believe are the most important in order for us to have reform in the schools. And that is to make sure, it's pretty simple, but it's uh, to make sure that every single classroom has a quality teacher, to make sure that every school has a quality principal. And um, we have problems in this state and in our district in general in coming together on philosophies of dismissal of teachers, of um, how long you let a teacher stay in a classroom you know, that isn't, isn't working well before you take them out of the classroom, or as Obama said so eloquently today, um, counsel them to another profession. Um, but but the, I'm just being real. I'm just, I mean, I believe that the teachers union 
um, they, they also, they represent teachers that they don't necessarily select. And so it's not like they're going out to find these teachers and then personalizing it and saying, these are my teachers, I'm going to keep them here. It's, it's just that we're, we're at odds sometimes on what our goals and objectives are, but I think that our values from within are that we want the best for the kids, but we haven't yet found a way to work together, and that becomes a big obstacle because we spend the majority of the adult time, and um, I think Shane knows this from working, and Angela knows this, we, we spend the majority negotiating adult issues that have really nothing to do with how well the child is going to do that day in school. And that's, that, is, that is against everything that I believe in. Very clear. The union's role is to protect the workers. That's what they're there for. Right. Pedro, are unions too powerful? Uh, when they're obstructing change, they are. And they're, um, Aren't they, they always they're obstructing change? No, no. What um, reform, Marlene, what reform have they been for? Well, I mean, I can't contest by L.A. They might be. Okay, what, what, <laughs> what, what reform have they been for in New York? Well, we have, actually have some uh, union that runs a charter school in, in New York. Um, so, I mean, I can give you... But they weren't at the forefront of, of charter schools. No, not at all. And uh, What reform has a union proposed for in, in the classroom? There was uh, actually the, the AFT proposed uh, the creation of enter, uh, education enterprise zones where teachers will be paid additional money to go into high need areas. That's not a reform, that's more money more for the teachers. I, mean, I, I support that. One, I, right? think, I think that actually makes more sense I than Merrick I support that pay. too, but that's, I mean, that's not a great reform for a, a teachers union to say we want more, member, more money for our members. But think about it, if you want to, if we pay people more money to drive trucks in Iraq because they say they're gonna get killed, so they're gonna pay them more. If you wanna put people into high need schools, give them incentive pay, now you need to make sure they actually are good, before you do that, yeah. and say, if you're willing to work there, we're going to pay you extra to be in this school because these are tougher conditions to work under. Now, we shouldn't make them so tough. We should also focus on those conditions. But I think we need to, that the union needs to, to play a role in policing its own members, right? In, in it, it, when, you, when you allow, when you protect, They're not going to. Well, I mean, I think that they're in trouble. They're in trouble no, of, of let, being... No, let's, be, let's be honest. What yeah. union does that? They're not going to. Well, but see, the union, this is the thing, if, if teaching is a profession, right, and, and I think this is always, this is an ongoing, it's a kind of esoteric debate, but it's an important one. Professions and professionals police their own members. That's correct. Right? And, and so the union, and, and in the districts that have adopted peer evaluation. Professions don't have unions. Well, Doctors they can have their have peer unions. Lawyers don't have unions. They're, 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 there are about 17 districts now across the country where teachers evaluate other teachers. And you know what's interesting? They evaluate out more teachers than in districts where it's the principals evaluating teachers. So when you empower teachers to play a role in, uh, in, 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 with standards to monitor their own members, you can actually start to change some of the conduct. And I think that, that's an important reform. You know, I think we're at a, just a very interesting time right now in the country and very much at a crossroads. Let's just think of the last election. Um, I mean, people voted overwhelmingly for change, and they did not want business as usual. I, I think a clear and amazingly strong message has been sent. And it's not just about the war in Iraq. It's not just about the economy. It is about education. I think people are tired of the kinds of infighting and partisanship and paralyzation that is just uh, stopping things from, from moving forward in schools. And so what we've done in the past has not worked. And I think the message is everyone has to change. And that includes unions. That includes schools and colleges of ed. That includes school boards. That includes all of us that touch the lives of kids. We can't do business as usual. So, you know, I think we have a time where we can we, uh, leverage this. Because, quite frankly, I don't think people are going to put up with it anymore. They're not going to put up with it anymore. And I think that... Unions, schools of ed, um, all of us involved. Either we are going to change or we're going to become irrelevant. I, I, I agree. And I, I also wanted to say that you asked the question about what, what um, unions support reform. I, I want to be, um, as I want to say that I have had many um, collaborative relationships, uh, 
conversations with our teachers union. It's not that they're not thinking and thinking people about reform. It's just that our goals are not aligned. And, um, and, and um, they, in order to be a leader in the union, you need to do a certain kind of, you know, you need to protect your members or you need, mm -hmm. to, you need to do whatever union leaders do. And, um, and somewhere along the line, we have, we have not taken advantage of the opportunity that we all have to come together in our leadership roles and take down the walls and say, we are all leaders and this is what we need to do. And I just wanted to bring another, when it comes to uh, frustration I've had from within, it has to do with allocation of dollars. And I don't know if everybody understands that we, we provide our teachers lifetime benefits for themselves and their spouse for the rest of their lives. And they, they um, give, there's, there's zero, they put zero into that. And I don't wanna take health insurance away from anybody, but I think there comes a time when you're talking about affordability and you're talking about limited resources and you're talking about, you're talking about money going into the classroom that we need to reevaluate that, that formula yeah. to make sure that it doesn't bankrupt us, bankrupt us as we move forward because who, what business anywhere, you saw what happened to General Motors, what business anywhere can afford that kind of liability? And those are the conversations that are the hardest ones to have because they, they, uh, you know, they affect the livelihood. And on the other hand, if we don't have them, we are setting ourselves up. To oh, yeah. I mean, one of the reasons that many people go into teaching is not for the salary per se, but because they love teaching, but they know they're going to be protected for a long time. So they're willing to give up some compensation at the moment for long-term compensation. But talking about dollars and effective teaching, uh, Dean Shane Martin also sits on the Board of Trustees for Loyola High School and was a graduate of Loyola High School. How does a Catholic school system, like the one at the LA Archdiocese, they educate for one-tenth the cost and 10 times more effective? How does that work? Why can't we just replicate and make everybody go to mass and then schools, I mean, why can't we just replicate what they're doing in Catholic schools? Well, well Fernando, first of all, I, I want to discuss the last thing you said about, um, you know, people going into teaching in part, not for the money, but before the protection. I mean, actually, we've got to really look at this issue about the number of people that leave the profession. I mean, there are statistics that tell us that close to 50% of our new teachers leave this profession within the first five years. Uh, and, and that is just uh, a crisis for, for, the, for us. And, you know, people come into this profession because they well, are... Well, I think that's yeah. almost the same percentage for a lot of professions, like 50% um, of people who have law degrees don't practice law. So well, it's, not, it's not unusual. What business turns over 50% of its employees, you know? And how do you build a, a culture if you have rates? And in some of our inner city schools, these rates are even higher. It can be 75%. I mean, a veteran teacher is a second-year teacher or a third-year teacher. I mean, this is a crisis situation. People go into um, education, and they want to be teachers because they want to make a difference in kids' lives. Uh, they, they are drawn to this as a vocation. They leave not because of the money, but because either they haven't been prepared by their education programs to meet the needs of the inner cities that they're working in, or they're just tired of hitting their head against a bureaucracy. And I think those are the things we have to change. And, you know, in terms of, of, of the Catholic school system, which is the largest private school system in the country, uh, I mean, there are some, some successes. Um, there's evidence to show that the type of organization, uh, some of the things that Catholic schools have been doing for well over 100 years are good for all schools. If we think about small size, if we think about local control, local decision making, making decisions close to the kids, if we think about having a principal really having the authority to make decisions, being a CEO, if you will, of a school, these are the hallmarks of that local Catholic school in the inner city, and have, they've been doing it you know, for over 100 years. These are some of the things that we talk about in reform of urban education. I think these are good things. Um, I would like to see more dialogue with traditional public schools and Catholic schools so some of the best practices can be shared. To be sure, there's great differences as well. Great differences. I mean, you know, you've got, you've got different types of funding and you've got, 
you know, uh, faith-based schools versus our, our, our public schools. Um, but there are some things that really can be shared uh, on both sides. And I mean, that's one of the things we try to do here at LMU across our programs is get uh, our, our students that are working in Catholic schools, our students who are working in traditional public schools and charter schools to talk to each other because they're working with the same kids in the inner city. Let me uh, open it up to uh, some of the students to ask questions. If uh, we're going to have a mic and we want you to uh, speak to the mic just so we can record it. Uh, well, first of all, I just want to thank you so much because I work actually in, at Cohen Elementary and um, I work in special needs, so it was really exciting that you guys are here. I'm a little nervous. But um, my question is just for you, Marlene, actually, um, I recently there is some legislation that the kids have to go um, half of the day in a special class and half the day in a typical class and I've only seen this work at one school so I just wanted to see your take of it like throughout the district. Talking about the special needs kids needing to be included in mm -hmm. um, in a regular classroom. Yeah and I just wanted to see um, if you how that's been working throughout the whole district because I only get to see it at one school, and so I just wanted to see. Is it working? Yeah, is it thank working? Well, thank, um, you, Jane. thank you for your question, and it's close to my heart. And um, Vicki Graff is in here, who's the head of special education here, could probably answer this also. But um, now she's got her own class. <laughs> <laughs> um, special. We have. We have. We're very challenged in our district with um, special education and the number of kids that are in special education and the high amount of kids that are over identified that are in special education and um, and the fact that we are now including them in regular classrooms and um, we are working very diligently to make sure that it does work and to make sure that the child's needs are being met but I have to say that we're not doing a good enough job and um, and again, it varies as does everything else we do from school to school, depending on the leadership at that school and the principal and the teacher's capabilities. And now that we are including kids in the regular classrooms, it's even more important for all students who are going to be teachers to be trained in differential learning and teaching because you need to understand how to teach special needs kids inside of a regular classroom alongside of everything else that that you need to do. So I'm hopeful that it's working in your school and it's working in a lot of schools. And we're not there yet where I can feel confident standing up here and saying that it's working everywhere. Pedro, what do you think about this? I mean, I think it would have to be a real special uh, teacher to be able to handle this. And I could imagine, let me play devil's advocate here, parents saying, hey, what about the other kids there? If there's a special ed kid there, the teacher's gonna have to spend an inordinate amount of time with that one student taken away from the others? Or do they get a teacher's have, aid? Yeah, or? We don't have, um, it's, it's a law, and so it's, um, it's the way, it's, the way that it's, it's about how we train teachers and manage expectations and make sure that all children get their needs met. And um, I think that there are schools, in fact, we have a wonderful charter school, the Chime Charter School, that is setting up a model that not only are the special needs kids doing exceptionally well, but they're actually impacting in a positive way the way all children are learning. And so I think we have a lot to learn from this. I think that, I think when you talk about the diversity and the demographics of a population, special needs fits right into that. But I'm, I'm sure this charter is that, that if you take a charter in, in, in isolated cases, you're going to have some great successes. But to implement this district-wide, it well, seems it's, incredibly... It's, it's, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a special education in and of itself. I was sitting up here in another panel discussion on just special education mm -hmm. and this subject, and it's a very large subject that, um, that we can spend a lot of time on. But um, it's, for me, personally, I feel that every child deserves to be taught to their maximum potential and to be taught the way they learn. And we have gone from individualized instruction to um, managed instruction. And I think we need to find, to find a way in which you're trained as a teacher where you really, res where, first of all, going into teaching needs to be elevated to the kind of respect that there's probably nothing as complicated as having 30 children that you have to teach something to and they all learn differently as all of us learn differently. 
and, um, and we have to elevate the kind of training that we give to people going into teaching, like I said before, so that they're prepared on that first day to deal with the, different, the differences. Yeah. So it becomes, it becomes this is the norm versus we're upset because we have children that have different needs. I think that we, we have to, we have to um, accept and, and train to and rise up to the occasion of this is what we have in our classroom. It's difficult to argue against that, but on the other hand, we are continuously asking schools to have medical clinics, to have increasing counseling, to every social issue that a child or anybody faces from K through 18, we then force the schools to deal with it. And now we're, we're asking schools to do even more. Uh, are, am I out of touch here, Shane, or is, is, well, is you know, something? On the issue that, that our, our speaker raised about the you know, inclusion, I mean, I think we have to really go back and say, what's the purpose of public education and democracy? And what's the relationship of schools? And you know, by extension, I would say even private schools, Catholic schools, uh, there's a big role to contribute to the common good. And so who are we as a people? I mean, we can have uh, individuals with specialized needs in our schools. They're not going to go away when school finishes. You know, so the, the very premise of why we embrace inclusion is because this is who we are as a people, and we are preparing uh, the next generation of citizens to live with each other in a democracy. And so if we can't do that in school, we're not going to do it in society and in life. Right. But how many times do we say that? If we can't do that in Plain school, devil's advocate. I mean, I just... You know, and Catholic schools get away with not having to do some of this stuff. Well, actually, Catholic schools have had gone through huge changes in the, um, the whole approach to inclusion and students um, with disabilities and specialized needs and are, are, are very much embracing uh, the philosophy of inclusion because it's part of the mission of Catholic schools. How can you be a Catholic school and be committed to building community but say there's some kids that aren't going to be able to fit here? Are there, spe are there special needs kids at Loyola High? Absolutely. Of course. I wanted to also just add that um, I said it before, I just want to make sure I say it again, which is that um, in the area of special needs, we have to remember that without the right kind of skills that teachers need to have, lots and lots of children end up being over-identified, um, not because they are special needs, but because they're not being taught correctly. And I think that's a big distinction that we have to take responsibility for. And, um, and deal with. And so um, I think that we all, I, I think there's a, uh, this sounds like really corny, but um, I think that That's there's- okay, you're an elected <laughs> official. <laughs> okay. I think that there's a gift to, to the kind of, um, to the, a gift to inclusion um, that is probably wasn't, or maybe it was intended, that you learn that we are all special needs. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but that um, in, in a lot of situations, kids that have been isolated for special needs come into a classroom to only recognize that we may all look different, but in terms of special needs, we all have special needs. And I know I'm saying that, I, that's why I said it sounds kind of corny, but, um, but I think that we have learned a lot. And there was a speaker, to, uh, there was a, a question today for Obama from a, um, someone who was, um, um, I, disabled. Yeah, I was, <laughs> yeah, you were there too. And he, and he was saying, please recognize us in the workforce. And there is a stigma that needs to be erased, which is really not the topic of this panel, but it's, a, it's, yeah, a, it's so. close to my heart, about a stigma that needs to be erased about people who are different in any way, shape, or form. This man couldn't stand up, and so the person that was handing this person the microphone wanted this person to stand up and he was handicapped or disabled and said, you're gonna to have to accept the fact that I can't stand up. And so this, this, and this was on, this was at the, at the town hall meeting. So I mean, we, it, there's a lot to learn from mm -hmm. this. I would hate to take the whole time on that, this particular point, but there's a lot to learn. Yeah, let me go up there. Hi, um, I know several students who are thinking about joining Teach for America and they're joining it not because they want to enter the teaching field long term but want to use it as a stepping stone to go to grad school and law school. I was wondering what you thought about programs like Teach for America who take students directly out of college who may have no educational training and put them in some of the most difficult and underprivileged 
um, schools around the country and what you would do to encourage the more qualified uh, teachers to um, apply for jobs in those areas. If, if, if I can Go ahead, address the uh, Teach for America uh, teachers in the schools that I serve in, one of the things that's really interesting is, is that the, the screening process for Teach for America teachers is probably one of the finest because they not only are looking for someone who has the skills because Teach for America says we'll help you acquire the skills, we're going to place mentors and um, support with you to do that. But what these young adults have are, number one, high expectations, a high moral compass, a belief that children can and will learn, and they have a desire to give to the community. One of my schools, Markham Elementary School, Markham Middle School has uh, about seven, seven first year TFA and about six second year TFA. And of the six second year TFA teachers, what happens is, is they really do find um, reward in the teaching and they've gotten the support. And young man from Harvard, he was going to medical school, he's staying. What I do believe these program TFA offers is a very fine screening process because you have to do more than just have the skills of teaching because then you're just teaching the subject. We want people who want to teach our children and serve in communities that are underperforming. It is a great vehicle. I think that one of the shortcomings from my stance at an underperforming school, if they're not supported or if they don't catch that fire to teach, then they leave. And then we have schools who have not the sustainable um, teachers at the school and really it creates a system of abandonment for our children because they stay two years and they leave. What we're hoping to do through the partnership is really provide additional support. We're working collaboratively with the TFA um, support in, in Los Angeles. And what we're seeing is, you know, I'm having conversations with Veronica, the sixth grade teacher, and she's staying. She's making a decision to, to stay longer. Will she stay 10 years in teaching? I don't know. But what I do know is when they are supported, they stay. And what I also know is when I watch them teach, there is excellence in that teaching. There is a moral compass that says, I expect high things from our children, and our children are responding to that in these schools. I wanted to add to that that a couple of things. One, my successor, Steve Zimmer, who just walked in before, he's in the back. Um, he's been in uh, education. Good luck. He's been in education. I believe this is your 17th year teaching and was a Teach for America teacher. So there are. There are people who stay. I also, Dan Neiman's in the audience. He's, he works for me. My entire staffs are usually people who have come from Teach for America. But what I wanted to say is that Teach for America also has a really great training program. And we need to learn from their training program some of the things that they do that prepare their teachers for the classroom. And then the last thing I want to say to the students who are considering Teach for America it's the same that I said before. I mean, you need to go through some kind of passion meter of what you really want to do, because there's one thing about moving forward to get into law school or however else you're doing this. But in order to be effective and to, to take on the responsibility of being in a classroom, you really have to love and want to do it, no matter what your, your next goal is going to be. Otherwise, it just doesn't, it doesn't work for you, and it doesn't work for the students that you're responsible for. So I think you need to really choose your path carefully. And I'd like to also speak to this issue. Um, you know, if we had schools across this country that worked well and worked well for all kids, and if we didn't have achievement gaps along uh, racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic lines, we wouldn't need Teach for America as an organization. Um, uh, the truth is, in, in many of our urban schools, in, in urban districts, we don't. I think one of the, and Teach for America is not at all without controversy. Um, here at LMU, we are one of the largest partners with Teach for America in the country, um, the largest partner, university partner in Los Angeles. And what I can tell you is that Teach for America's theory of change, I think, is not well understood. I don't think it's fair to critique Teach for America as a teacher recruitment organization because Teach for America has never said this is what we're about. Uh, the theory of change is really, Teach for America is looking for people who will be lifelong advocates to reform public education and to close the achievement gap and to work for equity in public education through various means. Uh, TFA believes there needs to be a minimum of a two-year period in a classroom from which anyone would go and, and, and do whatever they do. That's arguable, that's debatable, whether it 
whether that model works. But I'm saying that's the model. So, you know, when a young person says, I want to do TFA to, to beef up my resume to get to law school, uh, I would really drill down on that and say, what do you want to do with law school? You want to be a lawyer that's an advocate for public education? You're a fit with Teach for America. If this is just a stepping stone, you know, you're not. So uh, I think Teach for America has an amazing um, ability to screen, as, you know, Angela talked about. Uh, and so we have to look at TFA by its own theory of change. Um, you know, here at LMU last year, 90% of our TFA core members signed on for a third year in the classroom. And now that's impact. So this is an organization that is making impact in some fields. And I also think an organization that over the years has changed quite a bit to, uh, to accommodate, you know, what's happening. Let me, go let, me, right. let me give a dissenting view, otherwise I'll fall asleep up here, too. Um, and that is, I, I, I support Teach for America, but I think it's woefully inadequate. And I, I, I think it's a, it's a sad shame that this country has to take people and give them six weeks of training and put them in the most difficult school. I think the point you made is absolutely well taken. If Teach for America was so good, we should put them out in the suburbs in affluent communities and trade them for actual experienced teachers to work in high need schools. I know of no research anywhere that will say that the least experienced people should work with the neediest kids. Show me the study that backs that up, okay? None. So let's admit it. We do teach for America because we can't find good teachers. And the other alternative would be to hire anybody off the street, which is what we used to do, right? But, but it's not a solution. We should, we should be up increasing the standards. We should be making it more difficult to be in teaching and easier to get out if you're no good. That's what we should be doing. But right now, we, we, we assume anyone could be a teacher. And that's part of the problem. We don't respect the profession enough to insist on higher standards. And we consistently assign the weakest to work with the neediest. The other thing that happens, and just, uh, just as to build on that, is that I think teaching is the only profession that you self-select to go into management. And you know, you, you go into teaching because you want to teach children, and to get more pay, you have to work with adults. And those are two different kinds of skills and two different kinds of people. And until we find career paths within the profession that keeps you in the classroom, if that's what you want to do, that enables you to increase your salary so you don't have to move into administration, um, we're not going to be able to find the very best for leadership in, as principals because so many people are going there because that's the career path to more money. Yeah, I agree. Deans shouldn't get paid as much as faculty. Uh, was that your point? Uh, yeah, right there. And then after that, Andrea and Catherine. Go ahead. Um, hi, this is a question for Pedro. Uh, thank you for being here all the way from New York, by the way. Um, organizational theory will tell us that large bureaucratic structures like LA Unified, you know, the bureaucracy gets in the way and um, I think there's no question that the dysfunctionality of this district um, really is a major hindrance to a well-prepared principal teacher coming in and surviving that kind of bureaucracy in spite of their well, their good intentions to do their best with the kids in their classroom. Is there, you know, considering that LA is smaller than New York but larger than Atlanta, is there anything you can offer around leadership theory, organizational theory, uh, lessons that, that we should look at from these other districts, Boston, Atlanta, New York? Yeah, if we can't fix them, can we also break them up? I mean, should we? Well, they were trying that for a little while here. I yeah, I think, I think they were going <laughs> to break it up to four, and they would, they would still be, four, the four districts would still be in the top 20 in the U.S., so. Well, I, I mean, I think a lot of it does come back to what I said before about continuity accountability, but particularly internal accountability being very important. Uh, I think it's also about uh, using data uh, better to be able to gauge what's working, what's not working, uh, and, and just consistency and coherence. And, and, and I, I don't, that's what, when you look at uh, the, the schools that are just in chaos, right, that's what you're, you, it just becomes so obvious what's not happening there. Um, and it's, and I have to say that, uh, you know, if you watch Beverly Hall, right, I, I, and it's interesting, Broad has, 
Atlanta, she was the superintendent of the year. Before that was uh, New York. Before that was Miami under Rudy Crew. Uh, you find a very consistent strategy. The superintendents say, these schools will be accountable to me. I will be responsible for what happens there. I will put extra resources into these high-need schools. I will lower class size. I, will, I mean, they will do whatever it takes to turn those schools around. And they don't blame. When you find a system where everybody's pointing their fingers at each other, you find a system that's not going anywhere. OK. You can, we're going to start with Marlene. And you can choose one, two, three. You can combine your answers. You can do anything you want. But you have one minute. Thank you. <laughs> First of all, um, in the eight years I've been here, the communities have gotten to be very much more sophisticated in the way that they um, organize around issues. And I think that's a very healthy and positive um, thing. I learned a lot from the community on our A through G debates. And I appreciate the community input. Um, I just really feel, no matter if it's whether we break up or we, um, or I'm sorry that you felt I said I didn't, we didn't have a strategy. It's not that I don't think we have a strategy. We do have a strategy, and, we have a, and we've had strategies at work. We just have a lot of, there are a lot of different groups that have conflicting strategies. And so what I really would like to leave with you is for those of us who love and adore the work of being an educator and whose passion remains fixated on how do we create the maximum potential of each child, I just really ask all of you and all of us and myself included to rise to the occasion so that the tears that are in your eyes and in so many others' eyes, we work together to fix. And we, we make that commitment to each other. And that's, I think that's probably, for me, one of the healthier things that I think that we can do. Shane. This is an urban lectures, lecture series that brings together students primarily uh, studying political science. And so from that perspective, my comments are that this is an interesting time in terms of what's happening politically in our country. But I also said that um, this, there's a crisis in education and a crisis that we need to address and that we all have to change, that everyone has to do something differently and think differently. You know, there have been uh, attempts to break up LAUSD from the top, from the outside, from different ways. You know, I just don't think that's going to work. Um, so I think our best hope in moving forward, in fact, is to rethink, reimagine the second largest public school district in a series of meaningful partnerships, family of schools, networks, whatever they may be called, that bring together partners, relationships teachers, parents, community leaders, universities, business leaders, stakeholders who have a, a, a vested interest in helping and working with the public schools in their neighborhood and making sure that the kids that they have a relationship with succeed. Pedro. So let me first say that um, even though I've been singing New York's praises, it's not the model system. There are schools that are struggling. There are, uh, and the demographics are very similar to LA. Uh, but there are a large number of high-performing schools that are also serving high-poverty kids. Uh, I was a judge last year for Principal of the Year. They had 300 people nominated. Of those three, we looked at the final 15, and those, their schools were outstanding, and these were turnaround schools. And that should be possible in LA, too. I would say this, and building on Shane's last point, if you're going to reconstruct and revision schools here, start by asking what are the optimal learning conditions that we need to create in all schools? What should the standards be? Not standards for what kids have to meet. We have the standards all backwards. What are the standards that we need to put in place so that kids have the opportunity to learn and build from there? And if you did that, I think you'd end up with very different schools. Angela? I think that we have to recognize that there has to be an urgency to change. I think in a large urban school district like LAUSD, I do not feel that the urgency, not necessarily that it's not from the top, but it's not throughout the system. The, our children are failing in our schools, and we have to know that we have to do some things differently. I think that we don't have to do a one-size-fits-all. I think there have to be a portfolio of school options available to our schools. One that we are working on now is really trying to be a catalyst for change and do something different in order to find out what the best practices are. Someone in the group said, we really do know the salient pieces to educate all children. 
and we need to make sure that all of those exist in all of our schools and unfortunately it doesn't happen all the time and I do think that we have to have a fine leader who has courage who has stick to itness and who has a pathway and an ability to build coalitions in a large community to improve our schools we have to have coalitions working with you with our unions really working them with them from the site level building family action plans where families who are are coming to the school how do we get them to bring other families to school we have to begin to look at our schools differently the needs are different I will end by saying that what I know for sure is that our children are brilliant if I ask you sir and any other educator you sit in classrooms every day they may not have the skills but they do have the brilliance this is not about intelligence and we have to know that and then we need to wrap ourselves around a set of skills that educate all of our children so school board member Marlene Cantor, Dean Shade Martin, Professor Pedro Noguera, and Superintendent Angela Vass, thank you for coming.